Hello and welcome to the Life Works podcast. Joining me today is Brian Decker. Brian is the director of player development and team development with the Indianapolis Colts. Brian, what a privilege to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for joining me. Mark, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Take us behind the scenes. Take us into the the locker room or the corporate offices of a professional sports team. What is it like to support a professional sports team like the Indianapolis Colts? It's a great opportunity. Going back just a second, spending 22 years in the military, Mm. I was never sure if I would find that sense of purpose once I left. You know, the military, you have a mission and it provides focus, the camaraderie. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to find that, but I found that in sports. And so I don't say support the team because I'm a member of the team. So I look at it a little bit differently and each of us has a role to play. When they walk out in the field, every one of us has contributed in some way to how we play the game. Being a part of a sports organization is great. You have the football, the competitive aspect of it. But what I find really intriguing is just the strategy and and, and like the team building and the coaching and the development, everything that really goes into putting a team on the field. Uh, And I think most people have at least a general level of understanding of that. But for the entire year, half of the football operations is, is trying to find the next you know, generation of players for the next draft. And then the other half is trying to develop and deploy the talent we have in a way that allows us to be competitive. One of the things that I really enjoy is just working in a space where it's really, it's all about the human factor. The product of our business is the talent we feel. And so when you have that as your product, I think your talent acquisition, your talent development, those portions or functions of your organization are fairly robust when compared to maybe a normal organization. Once in the organization, what I think it's really what makes it special is just to be a part of something, to have a role where you can create value in the, the relationships you develop with coaches, players, and scouts, because we are all in this together. We're unified in purpose, and we all have that same mission of climbing that mountain and ultimately hoisting the trophy. What do you look for in a player? Just to understand the process a little bit, I don't evaluate the talent. Coaches and scouts who really take care of that. So the coaches and scouts, specifically the scouts, they'll take a population of 2,000 seniors each year and they'll turn that into two to 400 draftable players. Then after a series of iterating on that, we'll probably end up with 200 plus or minus 25 players that we feel like have a draftable grade based on their traits. And then what I do is I come in and look at that population and the scouts have evaluated the person based on the feedback that comes from the people around them, the school, the academic counselors. I talk to the player, you know, and and what I really want to understand is his story. I don't think you can appreciate anyone where they're at in their life unless you understand their journey. And for me, that's the people, places and events that's ultimately shaped the person and the player that they've become. We all have a different profile too. Some of us are stronger in one area than the other. But this is a game of commitment, huge sacrifice and time and commitment. And so it all starts with me with drive. What motivates them? I want to understand that because that is the foundation of your work habits, your focus, and your resilience. What does this mean to you? If it's not important, you'll never really truly commit to it. So for me, I'm looking for, ideally, you want a player who has a strong inner drive. And I say inner drive as as opposed to external factors. We all want to achieve. We all want to achieve. The problem, though, having your motivation uh, tied to external factors is you start chasing the market. The highs and lows in, in your mood, your emotion, your commitment level vary based off of that. And I find that players who have a strong inner drive or purpose who are playing for something greater than themselves they don't seem to experience the same highs and lows because their drive never wanes. Secondly, I'm looking for people that can, that can handle adversity. Specifically, have they made adversity their teacher? And that is so important because the farther at each level of competition or if you move throughout an organization as your job becomes more complex, it, the demands placed upon you are increasingly more difficult. And so not only that, it's, I think anything worth doing is going to be hard, which means you need to go to the edge, whether that be taking risk and the approach you're taking to to solving a problem or just in your development, that willingness to push all the way to the edge. People who I think are the most resilient 
are more willing to go to that edge. They're more willing to get uncomfortable because they realize that's where the gains are made. If you think of the body, you know, what allows us to grow is just this desire to, to achieve balance, right? So we increase the workload on the body or the mind or any other system, and then we keep it under that load and then the body adapts and then we have a new high level mark. And so it's only those people that I think have made adversity their teacher, have developed resilience, have developed tools and strategies that allow them to tackle the difficult, that that truly see the greatest gain. I would imagine too that just along the lines of adversity, that because professional sports are so highly competitive, that as part of that, they have to be able to deal with loss as well, like things not going their way. Would that be included under adversity or is that another trait that you look for? I use adversity or, or resilience, the skill that's, that's being used there. I use it as an umbrella term, but definitely handling the highs and lows. You think about it in sports, we have businesses have four earning statements a year. We have 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And whereas I think in baseball and basketball, the seasons are longer and a loss here or a loss there, they are looking more at the trend lines, but every game in the NFL matters. And I think that's why it's the greatest sport. Like every game matters. And the level of competition is so close between the top and bottom team in the league that on any given week, you can get beaten. And so there's no doubt being able to handle setbacks along the way, you know, losses, but you also got to be able to handle success. It's, I think it's harder to remain successful than it is to become successful. You know, it takes more of you. And Yeah, you got to be able to handle the highs and lows. And in any given team, you have that cumulative win-loss, but then there's tons of little position battles and individual goals being met or falling short of on a daily basis. And you got to be able to process those. And the best players, the players I find that are most resilient, they learn that lesson early on that I have to focus on the things that I can control. I really have to focus in on the things that I control. And they focus in on their process, the way they prepare, the way they practice, the way they focus in their effort. And you got to allow the results to take care of themselves. That doesn't mean that winning is not important. We all want to win. And ultimately, we will all be judged based off of wins and losses. But we really focus on the process that that allows us to arrive at that game with a high state of readiness and then to be able to manage our talents through it. You spent a huge portion of your career around high performance people. You spent many years in the Army Rangers, the Special Forces. You've also spent considerable amount of time among professional sports teams as well. So you've spent a lot of time among top performers, not just high performers, but we're talking the top 0.01% of those organizations. How would a person know that they are an objectively high-performing person? I like to think of it in a a couple different ways. When it comes to high performance in any domain, there's always going to be those skills, experiences, expertise specific to that domain. That's the one thing the, the NFL and Special Forces are, when it comes to the domains and the skills required, the experiences needed, the levels of performance, they, they vary greatly. But I do believe that those who are high performers at their core, they share a lot of the same traits and attributes. It's another one of those things I look for in the evaluation process is that they're extremely smart in their activity. I'm not talking about academic intelligence. I'm not necessarily talking about like any type of measured intelligence, but they see and understand their, we'll call it sport. They see and understand their sport at a very high level. So They see, they understand concepts, they see patterns, and they're able to simplify that down and make judgments and and have intuitions that allow them to see opportunities that many don't see. You know, a a good example of of that would be the Polgar sisters who were raised in Czechoslovakia to be, they were raised to be chess players. Their dad was a psychologist. He wanted them all to be amongst the best in the world. And one of them, they all three did, did exceptionally well. The one that was the highest achieving, there was an interview on National Geographic where there's an investigative reporter and he's talking to her essentially about her development timeline. And they're at a sidewalk cafe and she's got her back turned to the street. And the gentleman that's talking to her is talking to her about her practice habits and the way she approaches it. And during that, there's a panel van comes by and he asked her to turn around. 
And when she turns around on the side of that panel van are four chess boards at various states. And no quicker than she turned around, he told her to turn back around. And he looked at her and said, can you recreate those games? And immediately she, with four chess boards, she could immediately recreate those games. Every one of the pieces were in the correct spot. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean she is super intelligent cognitively, but her study and understanding of her sport and her activity, she was able to very quickly see that and to chunk it into meaningful patterns that would allow her to operationalize it. And not only could she have recreated those, she could have played out all four of those games in their mind. A lot of them do speed chess where they're playing six, seven, eight, nine games at a time without even being able to see the board. So they have to see it. So what's underlying all that? I think there's a lot of self-study and experience in your field, but it's the development of these vast mental models that allow you to conceptualize your activity and to hang your learning and experience on in a way that informs your judgment and intuition. So it sounds like the mental game, aside from the physical game, is equally important, if not more important. Would you agree? At this level in, in the NFL, everyone is talented. What happens is that becomes a push. What really do, really will stratify the population it is the mental game. The players who, who are going to play early, contribute early, see their role expand and have long careers, they're going to develop a very advanced understanding of the game relative to their position. And so what happens is, you know, if you think about if you think about a cornerback and he's matched up on a wide receiver, if he doesn't have a really good understanding of the game, when he's lined up, the wide receiver can do anything. He can go any direction. He can release inside, outside. He can, you know, whatever. But if you've studied the game, you understand the formations, you understand the leverage, you know where your help's at. What he's able to do is simplify it down. He really can only do these two or three things. And by doing that, he's able then to narrow his focus down to reading those keys which allows him to rapidly make decisions. Both in the military and in football, it's the speed and and accuracy of your decisions that ultimately determine success or failure. So let's talk about a player who is having a difficult time. Maybe they're going through a slump. I imagine that even in professional sports that you see those too. How would you help that person go from lower performance to being a high performer again? It happens very organically, but you have to create a conversation. You have to understand where they're at mentally. You have to understand how aware are they of their situation and the factors that say maybe emotion or other things are causing them. And just use that period of kind of like survey in the landscape to find a couple of things that are actionable. It probably all starts with just mindset. How do you appraise situations? How do you appraise situations? So typically when people talk about a slump, you're starting to see things compound, right? You have this negative and then we become hyper-focused on that negative. I think most things it begins with, it's starting with the right mindset. If you start with the right mindset, you're less likely to be taken off track. Where we have difficulty in life is whenever life doesn't match up to expectations. And the larger the gap between what we expect And what actually happens, the more frustrated or emotional or negative we become. So a part of it is trying to get them to not to assign, not to predict or to try to play things out in their mind, but to only focus on what it is that they can control. And to me, one of the things that helps you be resilient, it's almost like a dashboard for resilience. Where is your mind? Are you able to be right here, right now, 100 focus? It's you and I, Mark. We're sitting here. We're talking. Or is my mind in someplace else? Am I frustrated about something that happened yesterday? A missed opportunity? Am I anxious about something I have to do later on today? But whatever that is, our our mind has the ability to time travel. And what happens is whenever I'm 100% focused, I tend in the moment, I tend to be able to control my emotion. I'm focused on my performance cues, whatever that is. If I'm in an interview or whatever that is, I'm focused on those performance cues. And I'm not caught up in the past or the future because as soon as I start shifting through that, that where we start dividing our attention, our mind can't multitask. So as we switch between the past, the present and the future, we're basically just dividing our attention. And one of the first things we will feel when we do that is we will feel rushed. We will feel like we're speeding up. So one of the ways in which you just slow everything down is have the right mindset, 
learn to stay in the present, have the awareness to know if you're in the present and it's shifted, and then learn tools and strategies that bring you back. You know, the mental game is not going to make you more talented. It's just going to give you more access to your ability. So let's talk about the opposite. How do you unlock peak potential in an individual or in a group of people? I think that process is, is fairly long, unlocking that potential. Kind of in my own life or working with athletes and my children, I'm really focused on three things. I'm focused on health, I'm focused on development, and I'm focused on performance. And then what, based on those, I have goals and I have a plan that really supports each of those. And so to me, I think that development is the key to unlocking potential. If you were to sit and say, what is the tool that has probably developed and unlocked more potential in me than any other thing? It's stretch assignments, putting people, taking them into the deep end of the pool and throwing them in and having with the support necessary there to help them along the way and allowing them to grow into that position. I look at a lot of development activities and people want to do it in a classroom or they want to do it really the best way you learn and the best way you develop is on the job. It's by doing and it's by being challenged. So I felt whenever it came to like whenever some, some of the best people who I worked for and I felt like I was able to really help them in their growth and development, it was I was constantly challenging them. I kept them just a little bit more uncomfortable than they wanted to be. But I supported that by, I, they knew genuinely that I believed in them. And in many times when you're pushing people like that, you have to believe in them before they believe in themselves and you have to help them create that. And then it's just about coaching and mentoring them in that process. But to me, I think if you're going to unlock high potential, I think you have to constantly be developing and improving and growing because the game's constantly changing. We're constantly evolving, Right. I love what you said there about stretch assignments, constantly pushing that boundary mm -hmm. as they're going through the process of developing or development. They, you know, like you said, there are 16 or 17 game days every year and they all matter. Is there mm -hmm. any kind of game day ritual that you have your players go through to get them in a peak performance yeah. state of mind, or maybe just a relaxed state of mind to be able to go in. What is there anything that you do on the day? Because there's the development that you do off stage to prepare you for getting on stage or on the field. And then there's on the field, right? There's the actual game day. Is there anything that you do specifically to get players ready for game day? Me specifically, no. I'm more trying to help empower them and help them develop what works for them. I found that getting game ready, getting game ready is very individual. Some people like to be energetic and upbeat. They're listening to music. They're, they almost hype themselves up. More often than not, most people want to be calm, cool, and collective. They want to have just a clear mind. They want to start the game with a clear mind. So I don't, I'm not prescriptive in what they do, but what I try to get them to do is to develop a routine Really, the routine starts on Monday and goes all the way through the end of the game where what do you do the night before the game? What are you doing that night in the hotel room? What kinds of things are you doing? Just that last little bit of touch up, the visualization, going through the script, thinking it through, playing out scenarios in your head. Because the game, we, we coach it and we call it to happen in a certain way, but we know they never walk those dotted lines on the grass, right? You want them to set and visualize and work through, develop what is it supposed to happen in this play? Okay, what could happen? Visualize, think through it, get a level of comfort with what could happen. But then on that day of, they typically, the best are gonna have the same meal. They're gonna eat the same thing at the same time. They're gonna ride the same, there's three buses to the stadium. They're gonna go over at the same time. When they get there, their locker, that two to three, sometimes four hours before the game, the best will always look the same. They will constantly rinse and repeat that same process. And I think there's a part of it that creates a state of readiness and activation. But as much as anything, just going through your routine controls your mind. It gives you, look at a pitcher when a pitcher gets up on the mound between every pitch, what is he doing? He's touching this or a batter's touching that. And if you watch them, they, they do these rituals each time. 
what that does is in, instead of focusing on things that don't don't matter, it brings them back to the present to the point where they get ready to make their move in which they become hyper-focused on their performance cues. So these routines, I think I think the most productive people that I've been around are all have great routines, that whether they get up in the morning, they read, they ride, they exercise, whatever it is, they found something that works for them. And I think it manages attention and it allows your work habits to not be willpower, but truly be habits. They become reactionary. It doesn't take any effort. Okay, I'm up. I got to do this. Now, they're not dogmatic. Most players will adjust over time. And that's one of the things I, I ask young players is, do you like your routine? Do you feel like it's creating a state of readiness? Is there something you need to change? Because this is what they need to be able to do. This is no different than being a special forces soldier in Iraq. I tell them, you have to go across those white lines into the game, supremely confident that you left nothing to chance. You have to be confident in your preparation. You have to be confident in your routine. What that allows you to do is to be present when the game starts. For special forces, is you, it's going outside the wire. When you leave that compound to start a mission, it's game on once you go through the gates. And what you can't be doing is thinking about things that you should have done or could have done. You need to be supremely confident in your preparation. And when you do that, I think that gives you full access to your talent. What do you do for yourself? What, like, what's your morning routine or what are some of the rituals that have been really helpful to you? So there's a couple of things that I do every day. My day is fluid just by the nature. I have to react to other people's schedule and stuff, but I typically am going to work out every morning. I do some sort of physical activity every morning. Running is probably my primary thing, but also strength training and other types of weightlifting. I'm going to read every day. I say read and as long as I read one page, I check that off. But I'm not just reading to be reading. I'm reading with an emphasis on growing and learning something new or adding a new perspective to a problem I'm trying to solve. I meditate every day. I meditate every day. And, and meditation is, it's, to some people, it comes off hokey. But if you understand the value of how to use your attention, I mean, think about the things that are using, drawing upon your attention. When you meditate, you become very aware of your internal state, your emotions, and you become very aware of how you're spending your awareness, your attention. And then, and I think you learn over time how to shift and control that. So I do those things every day. And then other things that are just really important to me, I'm, I'm just fascinated with nutrition. So in, in, nutrition and longevity, those are fields that are rapidly expanding. And I'll listen to podcasts or read about those as well. But I would say so, reading has probably been the one thing. People talk about your time in special forces. They talk about your time All in the that. NFL. And that's provided me a great foundation of experience. In two industries where the product of the business is what you feel, two one percenter industries. They're the end of this evolutionary process in their field. So it gives you a great experience. But what I've overlaid upon that, probably a thousand books in the last 10 years that I've read. And every one of those, I'm reading it to try to take a new perspective. But I think when you're able to integrate your experiences with your self-study, I think that's whenever you start to hit that sweet spot, you create wisdom in the form of judgment and intuition. You become better reads and you see opportunities and you see ways of doing things. I see things now that I didn't see 10 years ago. Some of those things that were difficult early on, very effortful or effortless. And so that allows me to take on you know, greater challenges. You mentioned your special forces experience a couple of times. Tell us a little bit about that. What did it take for you to become one of the elite warriors in our military? Well, selection is an individual effort. Getting to the organization. When you think of selection, think about the combine and the draft process all together. It's a 24, at the time when I went through, it was a 24 day process that where you're going to go through cognitive and psychological testing, you know, background checks, you're going to go through a, a ton of physical measurements, a whole host of, of physical activities. And then once they say, okay, you've met all those base prerequisites, it's almost like resume screening. Now you move to the second phase where they say, okay, can you take these raw talents, these abilities that you've demonstrated, now can you apply them? They use land navigation or orienteering for it. And, and you could do, we could talk for hours, but all special operations around the world, their selection programs use land navigation because it's very physically demanding. 
It's also very intellectually demanding, you know, your spatial intelligence, awareness, and there, and it tends to be, you have to be able to manage uncertainty because it's, it's like anything else. You rarely go point A to point B. They go through their second phase and then they say, okay, I can apply that. Now, once we've said, now you're, ta- you have the talent and you have the ability to apply your talent. Now we bring you together into a team and we put you through team week and team week is four days long. And it's probably, it's very equivalent to what the SEALs would probably call hell week. Everything is done as a team. It is extremely hard, extremely long. They never know what they're doing. You never know one minute to the next. There is, so you're constantly have to manage uncertainty. You receive zero feedback, no feedback. So you don't, for people who need that reassurance or that affirmation that they're doing, you get zero feedback. The only time anybody ever gets involved is if it's safety related. And then within that, it's done as a leaderless group. Now, this is a really unique challenge placed upon the group because no leadership is assigned, nor are you allowed to assign or create your own structure within it. And, and so it's, it is, in fact, what we call a leaderless environment, which means it becomes a social-based endeavor. It's very merit-based how you work together to solve problems. You may have to move, let's just say hypothetically, you've got to move a 55-gallon barrel of water 10 miles and 12 hours, and you've got this little bit of equipment. So it's almost like the Pareto principle. When you turn, you drop the problem in the middle of the group and you, it's chaos. You just watch them self-organize around the problem. People naturally will take up and start communicating and scoping the problem. Some people start working and some people struggle. They can't handle that environment. But what happens is that the team has to organize around that. And, they, and, they're, and once they start moving, we constantly... Take, give them things or take things away. So they're constantly having to adapt to change. So the reason why we do that is special forces is a very, I think it differs from the other special operations around the world in the sense that it's very people centric. So our primary mission is unconventional warfare. And that doesn't mean anything to most, but they go. we go into other countries. We link up with like a host nation force or an indigenous force or an insurgent force. We partner with them. We train them and we get that we work alongside them as we accomplish complementary objectives. And in order to do that, you have to be able to, it's, it's no different than leading an organization. You have to go in there. You have to understand their motivations and intentions. You have to be able to lead. It's, and so that's the reason why we favor that team week so much is because you have to be able to map out and navigate the human terrain. We all know high performers who just aren't great with people. In an individual manager, they do great work, but they're not good in a team setting because for a whole host of reasons. You have to be able to compete and complement your teammates in a way that allows you to showcase your talent, but at the same time, not at the expense of others. So being in special forces, even being in professional sports, there's a great need for mental toughness. How do you develop a sense of mental toughness? I think we did it mostly passively in the military in the sense that we just kept putting you in really difficult situations. And and if you didn't rise to that occasion, you just, you got washed out, which, and so what we were trying, what people learn early on is just try to be more capable than your problem. But so There's no doubt mental toughness is huge. That ability to, you know, manage your attention, focus, emotions, all those things. If I were to go back and if I were a team leader today and I was working, I would do more work around mental skills. Because one of the things I think it's not fair to just throw someone into a really difficult situation without giving them tools that help them management. Listen, we all struggle when we don't feel like we have options. But as long as we have hope, as long as we have options, as long as we have Tools that are at our disposal that we're comfortable using, we continue to fight. We continue to fight. So I think that teaches them how to appraise those situations and give them skills that allow them to manage the very difficult situations. One of the things I did, one of my last assignments, I commanded uh, SEER school. And for in layman's terms, it's survival school. And what we're trying to train people do is to give them the skills and the mindset necessary should they become isolated from the team behind enemy lines? Because that's the worst case scenario. But everything is designed around creating hope in that individual. 
He has to believe. If you, I don't know if you read uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, of course. You know, and he talks about that. But we have to believe in the possibility of overcoming this. As soon as we see that we, as soon as we no longer have hope, we shut down. We lose the motivation, the drive to, to continue to work and to persevere. So what I find is if you create a team that, that has these skills at their disposal, when they get into difficult situations, they go back to the bag and they start looking for clubs and they're willing to iterate and try new things. It just gives control back to you. So I want to shift a little bit and talk about confidence. And I think that we're building toward mm. this, right? Everything that we've been talking about routines and habits and mental toughness and things like that. Are these the building blocks of confidence? I don't know if they're the building blocks, but it's the outward, it's probably the observable form of them combined. Mm. So to me, I mean, confidence is huge. Confidence is huge. It can be misleading at times because it's confidence is sometimes tough to judge. Sometimes we think the loudest person in the room or the person who's the most talkative or the smartest person in the room, they're the most confident. And many times that's not the case. Many times that's just their insecurities. So I find confidence really tough to measure. I always try to look at things and I, and I want to see how confident a person is in his approach. And I think confidence and arrogance are close cousins. They look the same to the outside. The difference is when you push on it, arrogance has no substance behind it and it very quickly collapses. If I'm going to take that confidence narrative and use it as a tool, I, I want to understand what are your sources of confidence? What are you drawing upon to create this confidence? And that's the part that gives controllability back to the individual. If you've got if you're excellent at taking care of your body, you do all those things, those preventatives to prevent injury, you're eating well, you're sleeping well, you're getting all the prehab in, you're practicing with great effort and focus, you're developing your skills, you're spending extra time at night on your film study to really hone in on the mental game, and you go throughout that week and you have a really good week of practice, then you have should have good confidence levels going into that game. But I will say this. Confidence can be has a downside too. And I think that's where you have to be realistic and, and appraise situations because some of the most confident people are also are your greatest risk takers. And sometimes they get themselves into situations where they can't get out. So if you were to ask me like the composition of a team, I don't want 10 highly confident people doing something really dangerous because I need a couple of people that are going to question the plan. So that's where having self-doubt can be good. Self-doubt, we look at as a negative thing. And it really, it's not self-doubt in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It's how you use it. So if you use, I know players who are super high performers who had all pro careers and have retired that had high levels of self-doubt. But what they did was is it caused them to be great planners. They would anticipate and think things through. They they would think the future through. They would realistically appraise that. They would understand the requirements and they would spend huge amounts of time in preparation to develop a level of confidence to overcome that. So if self-doubt fuels your planning and your preparation, it can be good. But for some people, it, it demotivates them. Get into the spiral of I'm not good enough or am I good enough? or And that's where it becomes a detriment to performance. You want a person or two on your team has some doubt, though. You need, and I don't know if that's the, your composite risk manager, or wh whatever it is, but you need somebody that says, hey, listen, is this really a good idea? And I think it's healthy for a team. How do you build a culture organization-wide of high performance? High performance as a phrase, as a concept, is something that I think it's, it, Americans are one of the la last to really grab onto it. The Austri Aussies, the New Zealanders, the Brits, the Europeans have for a long time, they've had high performance models. They're small countries that compete on a large stage. They don't have this talent surplus that the Americans have. So they have to make the best of their populations. So one of the ways in which they do it, they just disaggregate their activity down into its components. For in football, that's, that's technical. There's a technique to catching, to blocking, to route running. There's a tactical component, which is a knowledge and decision-making aspect of it. There's a physical component to it. There is an emotional component to it. You disaggregate playing football down into its component parts. And then what you do is you 
then look at that individual. I think you tailor the approach down to the individual level. I think one of the one of the principles of high performance is tailoring development and resources to the individual level. There's numerous studies we where if you put people into a classroom and you teach to to the mean, you teach to the mean, your bad get worse and your worse get slightly better, but you're really all you're doing is watering down your population. So by disaggregating your population down to and giving them specifically the things, the resources, the plan, the feedback, the things that they need, I think everybody gets better. And one of the things about a high performance model is I think there's this prioritization, like what are my high payoff levers? You have to prioritize those things and work your way down. But it's like British cycling. They get to the point where they're spraying alcohol on the tires to get more grip. It gets down to where everything matters. And Olympic sports are great at high performance because they spend four years potentially to do an event that's going to take 30 seconds. And the margin of victories are in the hundreds of a second. So I think there's a lot to learn. But so to me, if you think about that, if you're in a business, we tend to think of things as jobs or actions or tasks. If we ever take in something that a person has to do at work and disaggregate it down, what is the what experience is needed to do this? What knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics are necessary to do that and really disaggregate that down and create those opportunities where you're building all the components that support the whole. But to me, I think high performance is this constant state of evolution and evolving and development. They're always iterating and improving upon it, tailored to the individual level. Hey guys, thanks for watching and listening. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.